V2PTE Academic. We are providing online PTE coaching and monthly practice test. You can also stay connected with us. Facebook, Instagram and Telegram. For more information visit our WhatsApp on given number. Subscribe our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for more updates. So, what do we mean by well-being? Health, happiness, a sense of achievement and contentment. A state of mind and body where people can thrive. Well-being is not something that is purely limited to people who are facing extraordinary challenges in their lifestyle, health or personal circumstances. Everybody here has a level of well-being. Music so often forms an intuitive part of our well-being management. Music to pick us up, music to calm us down, music to heal our sorrows. Our aim, at, through research, is to move from this level of intuitive application of music through to informed use in our communities, to take the next step in the understanding of the power of music in human life. Music already works for us on so many levels, whether it's soothing and teaching our infants, bringing people and communities together, adding spirit to our work and personal endeavors. But there is no reason to stop here. V2PT Welcome to today's lesson. We are continuing with our study of taxonomy. Taxonomy is how scientists classify organisms into different groups based on the characteristics that they share. So for instance, um, a good way to think about taxonomy is the U.S. Postal Service. If we want to send a letter to someone, we first start off by addressing it to the nation they're in. By default, we usually assume that's America, but it doesn't have to be. It could be England or Costa Rica or Spain, you put their nation or their kingdom. Then within that kingdom, you address it to a slightly more specific level, um, their state. So for instance, South Carolina would be the same as a phylum. Then within that state, you would address it to their city and then to their street number, um, the street they live on. Then you would address it to, say, their apartment complex. And within that complex, You'd address it by their last name to their family. And then finally, their first name to the specific person you want to get it to. And in that way, we're able to weed out all the 400 million people we don't want to send our letter to in America and pinpoint the exact person we want the letter to reach.
V2PT. As uh, Joanne pointed out, only one country, tiny little Bhutan, uh, wedged between uh, China and India, has adopted the gross national happiness as the uh, central uh, index of uh, government policy, and actually has had a good deal of success in education and in health and in economic growth and in environmental preservation, uh, and they have a rather sophisticated way of measuring the effects of different policies on, the, on people's happiness. But they are the only country to go that far, but you're now beginning to get other countries interested enough to do kind of white paper policy analyses about whether uh, happiness research, uh, what effects would it have if we used it more for public policy. Uh, you're beginning to get uh, countries like Australia, France, Great Britain that are considering publishing regular statistics uh, on happiness. Uh, so it's beginning to become a, a subject of greater interest uh, for uh, policymakers and legislators uh, in uh, different advanced countries. V2PT. There's sugar in a lot of foods where you don't expect it. And of course, you know, there's lots of sugar in donuts or ice cream or pastries or other things that are sweet, candy, of course. But there are other places where you see it and you don't necessarily expect it. So as an example, peanut butter. Here's a list of ingredients from Skippy peanut butter. And you see that sugar is the second most common ingredient. <coughs> Excuse me, you may know from reading food labels that these ingredients in any food label are listed in, in order of how much there is in the food itself. So sugar comes right after peanuts. Here's another example, beef stew. You wouldn't necessarily expect to find sugar in beef stew, but it's there. Now it's down the list of ingredients. It's actually toward the end. But if you look at the marketing of this and look at the can, it says there's fresh potatoes and carrots, but actually there's more sugar in this than there is carrots. And so you wouldn't eat something like beef stew and expect to find this to be the case.
V2PT. Haussmann's renovation of Paris was a vast public works program commissioned by Emperor Napoleon III and directed by his prefect of the Seine, Georges Eugène Haussmann, between 1853 and 1870. It included the demolition of crowded and unhealthy medieval neighborhoods, the building of wide avenues, parks and squares, the annexation of the suburbs surrounding Paris, and the construction of new sewers, fountains and aqueducts. Haussmann's work met with fierce opposition, and he was finally dismissed by Napoleon III in 1870, but work on his projects continued until 1927. The street plan and distinctive appearance of the center of Paris today is largely the result of Haussmann's renovation. In the middle of the 19th century, the center of Paris was overcrowded, dark, dangerous, and unhealthy. In 1845, the French social reformer Victor Considerant wrote Paris is an immense workshop of putrefaction, where misery, pestilence and sickness work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terrible place where plants shrivel and perish, and where, of seven small infants, four die during the course of the year. The street plan on the Tai de la Site and in the neighborhood called the Courtier des Arcus between the Louvre and the Hotel de Ville city V2PT We're thinking about this, and we're trying to say, all right, well, let's file a patent on this clicker. If I were to go to the patent office and say, all right, I want a patent on a clicker, period, the patent office would just laugh. You know, the clickers have been around for a while, presentation clickers have been around for a while, and so there'd be a 0% chance that we would actually get that. If we were to somehow convince the patent office that we should be able to get a patent on a clicker, period, it would, however, be incredibly valuable. Every single clicker that was um, made after this point would infringe. And when it infringes, maybe we take a one or two dollars each. That would add up to be a decent amount of money. On the other end of the spectrum, let's go to the million word version. I go to the patent office and I say, I want a patent on this exact thing. And those million words describe every single radius, every single um, uh, material, every single thing about this. And the patent office says, yeah, we have never seen that before. Go ahead and take it. Almost 100% chance of getting that patent. But the value of that patent would be close to zero.
V2PT. Um, I'm just going to uh, take on where Stafford left off. And the hormone I want to talk to you about is called melatonin. And it's synthesized in the pineal gland, which is a very small, it's the size of a pea in your brain. Uh, Descartes called it the seat of the soul, and it is where melatonin is made. Is this working? And it has a rhythm as well. And in a sense, it's the opposite of, of cortisol. It peaks at night. We call it the darkness hormone. In every species that we've studied, melatonin occurs at night. And it's a hormone that prepares you for the things that your species does at night. So, of course, in humans, we sleep. But animals like rodents, they're awake. So it's a hormone that is... Uh, related to darkness behavior. V2PT. Uh, what we're going to discuss today is how the, the Port of London was discovered and what we discovered about it. Now, um, if you look at the historical records of Roman London, there's only about 14 actual references to London in antiquity, i.e. contemporary references, and of those, uh, only one is in the first century, uh, there are none at all in the 2nd or 3rd century. There's only one in the late 3rd century, and there's four in the 4th century. So if you're a historian trying to write a history of, of Roman London, it's very difficult. You don't really have much data. You're going to depend on the archaeological evidence, the material evidence uh, of the port and indeed the town, to have any understanding of what happened then. And so what we're looking at here is how did we discover about the Port of London? There's no historical documentations, no um, customs books, no tariffs, no idea of the taxes. We have to understand the port entirely from the archaeological evidence. So that's what we're going to do today. So if we move on to the next slide. I love live streaming. 
So, <laughs> thank you very much. V2PT This course provides students with an in-depth understanding of the exciting dis disciplines of politics and international relations. Students will learn about the workings of political institutions in countries around the world and explore the complex field of relations between nations. Topics in governments, public policy, public administration, national security, and border control ensure that students receive a broad and current education in the range of issues which are covered under the label of politics and international relations. Students will undertake four compulsory units in two majors, one in politics and international relations and the other in governments and policy. They will also choose an elective major from a wide choice of options including political communication, international studies, international business, and national security studies. In addition to acquiring specialist knowledge and competencies in politics and international relations and commerce, students will graduate with a range of generic skills such as critical thinking, enhanced communication abilities, problem solving, and strong capacities to work with others. They will also develop ethically based and socially responsible attitudes and behaviors. V2PT. According to the World Health Organization, 400 million people worldwide have no access to essential health care. That's a staggering number of people. Some of those services include things like basic sanitation and clean water, prenatal care and vaccinations or immunizations for children. Many things contribute to this crisis. 
Sometimes people live too remotely to get timely care if emergency occurs. Even when living in a city, the patient-to-doctor ratio can be as high as 50,000 people to just one doctor, making it impossible for that doctor to meet the demands of health care in that area. These are valuable people made in the image of God who are physically suffering. Many of them go without a personal relationship with Christ. So we do this with a week of hands-on training consisting of a variety of topics like basic sanitation and hygiene, taking vital signs, wound care, and infection prevention, basic birth assisting, and emergency skills. Those who participate in training then have practical skills in supplies to care for others in the community in a way that glorifies God and opens a door for sharing the gospel in a new way. V2PT.